Greetings. Let's uh, begin this uh, post T discussion. This will be on what I call as real effects of pseudo forces. And uh, we will also discuss relativity, Galilean and also Einstein. It will uh, also pick up on the question that was raised uh, in the previous class about experience with inertial frame of reference and how to recognize it and what are the consequences of being in a non-inertial frame of reference. So causality and relativity. Okay, these are at the very heart of mechanics, uh, classical mechanics. And uh, we will discuss what are the implications of causality because the heart of Newton's first law, uh, which is actually found, which was found by Galileo. Galileo died in 1642 the same year when Newton was born. So Newton came after Galileo and Galileo had already discovered that in an inertial frame of reference motion is self-sustaining. I showed you that picture of a fellow dropping an object from the mast of a ship and it would fall in his laboratory. The results would be the same if the ship were at rest, docked or moving at a constant velocity. So this is what Galileo had already discovered. So if motion is self-sustaining, it is only the departure from this self-sustained motion which seeks a cause. Because self-sustained motion requires no cause. A body will continue to move at a constant velocity and you don't have to explain as to why it continues to do so. Because that is its natural state, it is bound to happen. But if there is a change in this, if that state of equilibrium is disturbed, that you push it, but then it stops. And now you ask, why has it not continued to move at a constant velocity? Then you come up with a cause that yes, there was an interaction, in this case it is a friction, that there was an interaction and it is this interaction which is responsible for departure from equilibrium. And then when you look at this cause, then you start asking further questions about this cause. You conclude, as Newton did, that the cause results in a departure from equilibrium, which manifests as a rate of change of momentum. Change of momentum is a result of this cause. The rate of change of momentum involves a rate of change of velocity, which is the acceleration, which is the effect of the cause. And this effect is proportional to the cause. So F equal to MA is a linear proportionality between the cause and the effect. So this is the principle of causality. And it tells you that if there is a departure from equilibrium, there would be a cause. And then modern physics asks, further questions about this cause. What is the nature of this cause? Is it a gravitational interaction? Is it electromagnetic interaction? Is it nuclear strong interaction? Is it nuclear weak? Is there a unification of this? There is this electro weak unification. So you get into further details about the nature of this cause. But your whole idea of what the physical interaction is, including important questions like what are the fundamental forces of nature or more appropriately what are the fundamental interactions in nature because in quantum mechanics one does not use the idea of force very much we talk about interactions so what are the fundamental interactions in nature so these questions are related to these ideas which is why it is very important to recognize that self-sustained motion seeks no cause and if you recognize 
defines a frame of reference in which motion is self-sustained, that is what an inertial frame of reference is. Okay? So this is the idea which is an extremely robust idea, which is a very potent idea which Galileo recognized. And this goes at the heart of mechanics. So I sometimes, you know, browse the internet for some physics related news and I came across this just one week ago, 20th April. And this is about the leap second correction which has to be introduced a few weeks from now. On 30th of June this year, a leap second would be added to the year. Everybody knows what a leap year is. Okay, that's when you have the 29th of February, a day is added. Now, every once so often, you have to add what is called as a leap second. And on 20th of June, one second will be added. And the reason is that the Earth's rotation is slowing down. And then to make a correction for that, you have to make a correction every now and then. So after this was realized, a number of leap second corrections have been done. I think all this information is available on the internet. I believe the number of leap second corrections until now may be somewhere in the vicinity of 25 or so. I'm not very sure about that. Now, this will have a very major effect because all the clocks across the world will have to be reset. Okay, the computers, the GPS, the cell phones, all the clocks, okay? And this has to be done very accurately because the atomic clocks, uh, as this news says, are accurate up to the quadrillion of a second. And then I asked myself, what is a quadrillion? And then I got this definition that it is a cardinal number represented in the US by 15 zeros, one followed by 15 zeros, and in Great Britain, it is followed by 24 zero. So I won't worry about that. Okay. So that is, uh, let us not get overly puzzled by that. Okay. But the main issue over here is that you have to make this correction called a leap second. And everybody who uses a cell phone, okay, understands the importance of setting the zero correctly. Okay your GPS, cell phones, everything, every technology, computers, communication, everything depends on that. Nobody can argue that this is an important thing which physics students need to learn. And the right place where this is introduced is in an undergraduate mechanics course. Okay, this is, these would be the first course after the high school. That is where these can be introduced they can be introduced very rigorously, and that's what we are going to discuss now. But let's take another example. And here I have these pictures of a solid, liquid, and gas. And you know that a solid has a shape of its own. A gas fills up the whole space of the container. A liquid settles down in the container. Okay? And now in this world of technology that we live in, it would be important for us not just to think about you and me, but also about the astronauts. Okay, they are in the spaceships, they are in rockets, they go all the way to different parts of the universe, they orbit the Earth, right? They go to the moon. And the question we will ask is what would be the shape of a liquid if it is kept in a sealed beaker? If this beaker is in the spaceship, what will be the shape of this liquid? Okay. Now, obviously, just like this leap second correction, I'm sure that all of you would agree that these questions are relevant to modern physics. And a student who is at an undergraduate level should have a good grasp of these questions. And what happens is he is not able to appreciate the consequences if he does not have much acquaintance with physics in an accelerated frame of reference. Okay, so this is where 
the inertial frame and an accelerated frame or a non-inertial frame uh, needs to be understood because the whole principle of causality and determinism that we have been talking about takes a completely different form in a non-inertial frame of reference. Okay, so these are some of the questions that we are going to discuss in this hour. So let's take an accelerated frame of reference. So here you've got a red frame of reference, which I will consider to be the inertial frame, which is the one in which motion is self-sustaining. And here, this green frame is an act frame of reference, which is moving along this black arrow at a constant acceleration f. So the displacement vector of the two origins, which is O, O double prime, okay, is given by this usual equation of motion, right? This, which is well known, right? So this arrow would keep increasing in its length along the same direction, and its length will increase linearly proportional to the initial velocity and quadratically proportional to the acceleration. Okay, that is the law which we know. So if you now look at an object in the red frame of reference, but you look at that object also, a different observer looks at this object from another frame of reference, then the two position vectors will be related through this triangle law of addition of vectors. Okay, so the position vector in the inertial frame is related to the position vector r double prime in the accelerated frame, so that you have to add this vector over here. Okay, now you take the time derivative, so you get the velocity in the first frame and see how it relates to the velocity in the second frame. And if you take the second derivative, you will get the acceleration. Now, this is the measure of departure from equilibrium, okay? How do you measure departure from equilibrium? It is in terms of the acceleration. And then you ask, what is this acceleration due to? When you identify that cause, that is the physical force or the physical interaction which has resulted in that acceleration. And that relationship is a linear one by the principle of causality f equal to ma. That's Newton's second law. So now you find that the acceleration in the inertial frame of reference, which is on the left hand side, is not equal to the acceleration in the second frame of reference, in the green frame of reference. Okay? So these two accelerations are not the same. And therefore, the principle of causality, which you would consider to be valid in the inertial frame of reference would not explain physics in the accelerator frame of reference. Okay, so the causality really breaks down. So the acceleration in the inertial frame of reference is the acceleration in the double prime frame of reference, which is this green frame of reference, plus the relative acceleration of the green frame with respect to the red frame. So that is the relation you get. If you multiply both sides of this equation by F, then you get F double prime equal to MA minus MF. So MA was your principle of causality. MA is what appeared in Newton's principle of causality. F equal to MA, it explained why an object departed from equilibrium in the inertial frame of reference. And F equal to MA holds good in the inertial frame, but it does not hold good in the accelerator frame of reference. Okay, so now you can ask that if you want to interpret F double prime also as a force, but then the force is F, which is MA, to which it is not equal, but you have to subtract something out of it. And what you have to subtract is just a mathematical product of the inertia M times the acceleration of the frame of reference. So MF quantity which you see in this relation here, it is this MF, okay? This MF is a completely mathematical construct. It is just the mathematical product of the mass and F which is just the acceleration of the green frame with reference to the red frame. And this quantity must be subtracted, it has got the dimensions of force, 
it looks like the force it has got all properties of the force in the sense that it has got the same physical dimensions ml t to the minus 2 however it is not a force in the sense that it is not gravity it is not electromagnetic interaction it is not nuclear strong or weak and whatever our perception of a fundamental force of nature is that does not go into this term mf which is why it is called as a pseudo force now if you subtract a pseudo force from a real force you get a quantity which is of course not real okay because from a real quantity you have this you have subtracted something which is not real so the result is also a pseudo force in a certain sense right so what you have on the left hand side f double prime is not the real physical force it is not the result of a real physical interaction but an observer in the green frame of reference can pretend that okay if I consider this to be my force then I can explain the acceleration that I am observing so to him the acceleration is a measurable and it is a real effect but it is a real effect of a force which is really not a physical interaction in the usual sense so this is what I call as a real effect of a pseudo force and as you can see it is very important to come to terms with this because this has got consequences on the shape of a liquid in a beaker that an astronaut would see it would have implications on the uh, atomic clocks which govern your GPS and your cell phones and everything so um, I, I will certainly like to invite you to this uh, article which is available at my website and um, I, I won't really discuss this particular uh, work which is reported in this article but I will certainly talk about this relationship that F double prime which is the quantity that an observer in the accelerated frame of reference would use to explain the departure so he's trying to invoke the causality principle but then he has to invoke a cause which is really not physical it is a mathematical construct of the fact that his own frame of reference happens to be an accelerated frame of reference so these are fictitious forces and therefore they are not involved directly in the physical principle of causality you cannot apply Newton's third law for that and yet we do come across students who say that the centripetal and the centrifugal forces are equal and opposite because they are governed by Newton's third law which is absurd and it is important that we correct these mistakes early enough so this is really important because the perception of a physical interaction is important for us to understand what exactly are the laws of nature so what we are going to do is to discuss some related issue, issues the weightlessness for example so if you are in a state of free fall okay if you are in a state of free fall then you are in an accelerated frame of reference an object which is falling okay is accelerated toward the earth right so this is an object in a state of free fall which is what it would be for an astronaut in a spaceship right and uh, these, these things have got very fascinating uh, consequences for example if you're a pole vaulter and jumping over uh, clearing a bar then it's possible to flex your body such that the center of mass of your body can actually go below the bar whereas the body flexes and clears the bar so now the athlete's skill lies in flexing his body swiftly and that is where his athletic skills are challenged to the limit that is how world records are set okay and he's able to do that because he in a state of free fall all he has to overcome 
is the inertia of his limbs and not gravity because he's already in a state of free fall. Okay? So he has to just deal with his inertia of the limbs, not gravity. And that is the reason he's able to flex his body so nicely. And I think all of us have know this. We, we have heard that a cat has got how many? Nine? Nine lives. Nine lives or 90 or I don't know how many. But it has many lives. And the reason uh, you say that a cat has got nine lives because however it falls, it, it falls nicely, swiftly so that it lands safe. And the reason it is able to do it is because it is in a state of free fall <laughs> while falling and then it is able to flex its body very easily okay which would not be possible without uh, this idea of what is an effective weight of an object okay an effective weight of an object in an in inertial frame of reference would be different from what it is in an accelerated frame of reference okay so um, the same thing is true for a liquid in a beaker? This is the question which I raised earlier. And these are obviously important questions for modern science. Okay, people have been going into space for well uh, over several decades now, right? I mean, it's, uh, um, was it in the 50s, 60s? Yeah. Yeah, in the 60s they already went to the moon. 59? Yeah. Something like that, yeah. So 57, 57 was the first um, Sputnik, I think, um, this Russian satellite. And um, now if you look at the shape of a liquid in a beaker in a orbiting uh, satellite, which is in a state of free fall, then everything is weightless, including the liquid inside the beaker. So gravitational interactions will not govern the shape of the liquid because here the reason liquid takes this flat shape for a beaker as you see in this bottle okay the reason the liquid has this shape is because gravity is holding it down right now that's not what is going to happen in a spacecraft so then it is the other interactions of the liquid which are normally very weak we don't look into them when you're just looking at water in this bottle but they become important and as a matter of fact they are important even in a laboratory because those are the interactions which determine the meniscus of a liquid okay you've got the cohesive interactions and the adhesive interactions these are the intermolecular forces between molecules of a liquid between each other or with the vessels and the relative strength of these interactions determine whether the meniscus is one way is it concave downward or upward right so that is these are the physical interactions which become important and now imagine these things happening in the satellite because then if the cohesive forces are important the entire liquid will settle together and you will have a globule of water or that liquid which is floating somewhere in the beaker Whereas the adhesive forces, if they are important, if they are stronger, then the liquid will stretch itself along the inner walls of the beaker, leaving a cavity in the middle. Now, for an astronaut who wants to have a Diet Coke, I think this is important because then he knows how he is going to suck on that liquid, right? So it, it's very important to teach these things. And one is able to grasp these ideas only if you introduce students to what exactly is an inertial frame of reference and what exactly is a non-inertial frame of reference. So physics in inertial and non-inertial frames of reference is very important and uh, these are the things which determine uh, these things. So I already explained uh, if, if you have one frame of reference which is moving at a constant acceleration moving in one direction now let's consider physics in a rotating frame of reference now let's consider these children playing um, on a seesaw now here if you have these kids if they're playing some additional games and one of them 
uh, is tossing a ball at the other, okay, and they are catching it and throwing it back and forth with respect to each other. But then, what if the seesaw is made to turn around the pivot? Okay, what will be the trajectory of the ball when one ball, one kid throws it at the other? Now, if you are standing on the ground, once the ball is thrown, its motion will be determined completely by gravity. Okay, its forward motion will be determined by the throw and vertical motion by gravity and it will go in some parabolic path. Those problems we have solved, right? But that's not the trajectory which the other kid will see. Because the other kid is now rotating about this. And this is a very real situation, not just on a playground, but certainly for these two astronauts. Because the satellite is usually given a little bit of angular mo motion, and that's to maintain stability because the angular momentum is a constant. So, so those are other details which I will not get into. But then there is a little bit of rotary motion which is given to the satellites and, and if these two astronauts are carrying out some work in the spaceship and one of them throws a spanner at the other fellow, they are doing some experiments, what will be the trajectory of this seen by the two astronauts? And they are now in a rotating frame of reference. And this is the example which uh, some of my students uh, worked with and they wrote a very nice uh, computer code which gives the solutions for the trajectories and uh, you're quite invited to use these codes and run them. And actually, uh, I'll give you one of the solutions that, that if the radius of the circle was 10 meters and th these are just some arbitrary numbers just for the sake of illustration, so they are not important. And if there is an angular speed of a certain uh, 0.15 radians per second, if the initial velocity is uh, 0, 5, x and y components of the velocity in meters per second in this frame of reference and the um, astronaut B, B for, throws a tool toward A then the trajectory turns out to be what you see by this green line which is really not something that one would have imagined as such, right? So these are very interesting examples and they tell you how physics would be seen in non-inertial frames of references. And this is important because they connect to us the very fundamental idea of what a physical interaction is because that is what goes into the principle of causality. Okay? Now let's take another example over here. Means we all know that we are in a rotating frame of reference. The Earth is rotating. Okay? From this time to the next time tomorrow, it would be 24 hours. Right? So we go through one full rotation. And if a rocket is launched from the North Pole and it is supposed to land at the equator and at typical speeds if it is to take about an hour to get there, then because of the Earth's rotation, it will not land where you thought it would, but that position would be offset by as many as 15 degrees. Now that's a lot of distance. Okay, on the equator you have about 111 kilometers per longitude degree and the distance would be about 1665 kilometers. Now think about it if you were or your students were to design um, intercontinental ballistic missiles or rockets. Okay. Now, this is important, okay? And it is absolutely important to learn how to handle the physics in these rotating coordinate systems. So, let us consider a rotating coordinate system. So, let's consider a frame of reference red, which is our inertial frame of reference. Let us consider an axis OC. And about this axis, let us have another frame of reference which rotates about this green axis at a certain angular velocity, okay? It doesn't have to be along the x-axis or y or z or something. It can be completely arbitrary direction in space. And about this green axis, you have got a frame of reference, which is the frame of reference 
Is it black or purple or I don't know what color it is. It's some dark color. Let me call it as black. Okay? Uh, this is the one with subscript red. Uh, uh, subscript R. So this frame of reference rotates about this axis OC about a certain uh, at a certain angular velocity and in both frames of references you observe an object which is at a point P at a certain instant of time. Okay? So there is some object whose coordinates the position vector is this in both frames. The coordinates will be different. Okay? The X, Y, and Z coordinates will be different. The position vector is the same. And let us imagine that this point is not moving it is fixed in the rotating frame of reference it could be this water bottle in our frame of reference okay because in our frame of reference we are on the surface of the earth we are rotating once in 24 hours but in our frame of reference this object is not moving whereas if i pick it up and drop it it is moving right so I'm looking at an object which is at rest in the rotating frame of reference. So the components of this vector in the inertial frame and in the rotating frame will be different. So let us look at it carefully now. So we consider this object which is at rest in the rotating frame of reference. And if it is at rest in the rotating frame of reference, it cannot be at rest in the inertial frame of reference, right? Because it is with respect to the inertial frame of reference that this other frame of reference is rotating. So the rate of change with respect to time, the time derivative in the inertial frame denoted by subscript i is different from the time derivative denoted by the subscript r. Time is the same. It is the time derivative which is different. So let us say that this is the position vector at time t in the inertial frame of reference and in the inertial frame of reference at a later time the vector appears to be different and this is the difference vector this is this red arrow which is db okay so this is b at t this is b at time t plus dt or delta in the limit delta t going to zero i take two points which are infinitesimally close to each other and this is the difference vector. So this is the difference which the observer in the inertial frame of reference will see, but the observer in the rotating frame of reference will continue to see it at the same point as we saw this bottle where it was minutes ago, and we see it at the same place even now, right? But an observer in the inertial frame of reference would see it to be at a different place. That difference vector is dB. So this dB vector is now, as you can see, will be on the circumference of this cone, as you can see from this geometry, right? And then it is elementary geometry to determine this vector dB. Okay, this is just high school level geometry, and without getting into too many details, you can see all the details in the detailed PDF, which will be on the web. So this is the difference vector dB. Notice that this circle will have a radius of b sine xi, where xi is the angle this circle subtends at the vertex O, right? So this radius will be b sine xi, and this difference vector will be this radius multiplied by this angular d psi, okay? So db will be given by the length of db times a unit vector, which is along this red arrow, right? And this red arrow will be the cross product of n cross b. It will be along that, but you must divide it by the sign of the angle so that you will have a unit vector because I'm just looking for the direction of this vector. So this is the direction and, quant and, and the size and the magnitude of the unit vector. And the size itself is b sine xi d psi, right? So this is your db. Now you can write db as b sine xi d psi and the vector will have this unit vector which is n cross b divided by the modulus of n cross b and now you can 
cancel this sine xi with this denominator because they are exactly equal. So what does it give you? It gives you db as d psi n cross b and therefore you can get d psi being omega dt, omega being the angular frequency, right? It will be the angular rotation, uh, angular velocity, uh, the rate of angular velocity of this rotating frame of reference, omega being d psi by dt, the rate of change of angle, and then you have db as omega dt cross b. What does it mean? That the rate of change, if you divide both sides by delta t and take the limit delta t going to zero, essentially you'll find that a vector which is at rest in the rotating frame of reference has got a time derivative which is given by the cross product of the angular velocity with the position vector b itself. Okay, now this is a very general result and a very important result because now what you can see is um, uh, this relationship between the time derivatives. Time itself is the same in both the frames of reference. It is the time derivative which is different. And if this vector itself was not addressed, for example, I take this bottle and throw it, right? And now it is not addressed anymore. So the original velocity of this in the rotating frame of reference will get added to this earlier velocity. So now you have a relation that d by dt of b will be omega cross b which we found from the previous relation but now you will have an additional velocity in the rotating frame which is given by the time derivative of this vector with respect to the rotating frame. So what is the general relation? This is true for any vector b. So you can extract an operator equivalence and this operator equivalence is that the time derivative in the inertial frame of reference is equal to the time derivative in the rotating frame of reference plus a quantity which is given by the cross product of the angular velocity with the vector itself. So this is a very general relation. And now we can apply this relation to the position vector of any object. It can be this position vector of this bottle. Okay? And when you apply this position vector, apply this operator equality. This is an operator equivalence. What you have in a red bracket is the relationship for the operator equivalence and you apply this operator to the position vector r in both sides of the equation and you can do it one more time, right? And when you do it twice, you get the derivative. You get the derivative of the velocity. You get the acceleration. And these are what you interpret as departures from equilibrium. This is the one for which you will look for a cause according to the principle of causality, right? So now you have got this relation and notice that the second derivative which is acceleration in the inertial frame of reference is not equal to the second derivative of the position vector in the rotating frame of reference. There are these additional terms and they're coming simply from this cross product and this relationship that we did you so easily in just one or two steps. Okay? So now you have this relation and if you multiply this by mass, you will get quantities which we would interpret as forces. So now we have multiplied both sides of the equation by mass. This mass times acceleration in the inertial frame of reference is our physical force according to the Galileo-Newton law. And you must keep that as a reference all the time. In every analysis, that is the physical reference of what a force is. Okay? That idea of force is what we would interpret as a physical interaction. It could be gravity, it could be electromagnetic interaction, it could be any other physical interaction. Okay? And everything else is appearing because of these mathematical constructs which are results of the fact that we were observing in a rotating frame of reference in an accelerated frame of reference. So these are the terms. So if you now write this mass times acceleration in the rotating frame of reference as F of R. So this is the perception of a force in a rotating frame of reference which would be what, how I would try to interpret the forces on this bottle then this would be the equal of 
a real force plus all of these terms, right? And they come with their own sign. So this term comes with a minus sign. This depends on omega dot. This is coming from this term, which is omega d omega by dt cross r. So this is the one which gives the leap second correction. This is the one which I mentioned a little while ago. And because the earth is slowing down, this correction has to be made. Then there is a component which is coming because of this cross product of omega with this velocity in the rotating frame of reference. So if in the rotating frame of reference, if this velocity was zero, as it is for this bottle, this term would not have any effect. But if this were falling, if it were to have some velocity of its own, then it will certainly matter, right? And then you have another term, omega cross omega cross r, which will uh, be valid even if it were not having any velocity of its own, that is the centrifugal term. So these are pseudo forces. And they do not come into the operation of interpreting physical interactions in the inertial principle of causality. Despite which we sometimes have students who tell us that centripetal and centrifugal forces are action reaction pair according to Newton's third law, which is very unfortunate and which must be corrected. Okay? And it has to be corrected very rigorously by giving them these examples. Okay? So these are important terms. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, quiz questions which I like to ask is that if you have a plumb line, okay, you know what a plumb line is, is some thread that you suspend at the roof and have a mass attached to that. And how would this plumb line orient itself? And how would you describe a vertical line with reference to the plumb line? Can you define it as a line, as a geometrical line, if you consider Earth to be a sphere? So do you describe a vertical line as a point joining the center of the Earth with a point on the surface and you extend it back and forth? Is that your definition of a vertical? Or is your definition of a vertical given by how a plumb line would orient itself? Is that your definition of a vertical? Or you can even give a third example, that you take a marble or any object and drop it. And then ask, is your definition of a vertical the same as the line along which this object forms? And if you look at these terms carefully, you will find that all the three definitions of a vertical, the geometrical definition, the plumb line definition, and the definition of a falling object, all of these three give you different space curves. Okay? It's because a plumb line which is at rest, okay, is not an object in a state of fall. Therefore, the Coriolis term would be zero. Okay? But the centrifugal term would be there. And that is the reason all the three definitions are different. So these are some examples of the consequences of carrying out observations in non-inertial frames of references. So in a rotating frame of reference, you have the lead second correction, you have the Coriolis term, you have got the centrifugal term. And of course, if the two frames of references are also in a state of relative acceleration with respect to each other, you also have the earlier um, effective weight kind of um, uh, situation. So th these are very important. Uh, because they determine the trajectories of rockets, airplanes, ships. If, you're, uh, if your students are becoming engineers and they are uh, devising, they are making instruments for navigation and they want to know where their position is when the ship is in a sea or if it is in air, okay? And even if they were not in MH370, they would need to know <laughs> their coordinates correctly, right? And there's no way you can get it right unless you incorporate all of these terms in your navigational instruments. So these are important for modern technology, for devising your atomic clocks, GPS systems, cell phones, and all these corrections. The leap second correction I already mentioned. The Foucault pendulum is a very popular and very nice example which we have dealt with quite extensively in this course. You can go through the details on the website. 
but they also explain some very interesting phenomena like vortex currents in a sea or in the atmosphere and so on. In fact, it would even determine the trajectory of a sixer hit by Tendulkar or any, maybe today I should talk about Virat Kohli, I guess. Um, this slide was made when Tendulkar was as, as, uh, at his peak. And um, if, if he hits uh, a sixer in the Northern Hemisphere playing um, in London, it would be quite different if, it, if he were to hit it in Sydney in Australia because on the North Pole and South Pole, both ways, you know, the deflection would be in the other direction. So these are the Coriolis effects which cause the um, uh, vortex currents of the cyclonic uh, currents, so, so they are clockwise in the northern uh, hemisphere, anti-clockwise in the southern hemisphere, and so on. So, so they have very important consequences in atmospheric sciences and ocean currents and so on. So let's go over to the other principle, which is at the heart of mechanics. So I mentioned causality as one of the dominant principles, which I discussed at some length until now. I will now discuss relativity, which is again at the very heart of mechanics. And this is a picture of Brett Lee bowling to Tendulkar. And we talked about updating this slide, right? So we thought we should have uh, Mitchell Johnson bowling to Koholi now. But uh, we can do that. All right. So uh, let's say that we are watching this game. Now, can you imagine this game played on a huge truck? Okay, so this is a huge play field, okay, and the game is being played, and there is no reason why the game cannot be played if the truck is large enough, right? Okay, and um, one could have a lot of fun uh, playing this game, and the game would proceed exactly the same way as it would if you were watching it on a play field, right? Now, Beckley bowls at 152 kilometers per hour. And if this truck was also moving at 152 kilometers per hour in the direction opposite to the ball, right, then the speed of the ball as seen by an observer on the truck would be different from the speed of the ball seen by an observer on the ground, right? And the way he will get it is by taking the difference of the two speeds, right? So the speed of the object depends on the observer's frame of reference. But then, mind you, this is not a hypothetical situation because the ground in Sydney or um, what is the Calcutta famous ground called? Eden, Eden Garden right? The Eden Garden. It's already on a platform which is moving, right? It is moving at the, uh, along the earth at 1650 kilometers per hour. So it's, it's already a situation that uh, we cannot really miss. And Galilean relativity is governed by the fact that the laws of mechanics are exactly the same in all inertial frames of references, whether it is on the playground or on the track or on the earth, the laws of mechanics are the same. So that is the principle of causality and uh, Galilean relativity deals with this. Now here we were talking about an object like the cricket ball. Okay, so what you're observing is the cricket ball and the, the speed of the ball is determined by the relative speeds. So the relative speeds determine, are determined by, means if, if you're walking, your speed is determined by whether you are walking with respect to the, to the earth, or you measure your speed with respect to the treadmill itself, okay, which is a good thing to do. But here, the difference of the speeds is what plays an important role. Now, here you're talking about the velocity or the speed of the chicken, or the cricket ball, or the man. But what will happen if the object you're looking at is not like a cricket ball or something, because 
all is, you would do to get its speed would be take the difference in the Galilean relativity as we have discussed earlier. What if you are looking at light? You are not looking at a cricket ball. You are looking at light. What is the speed of light? And another observer is also measuring the speed of light. And he is not in an accelerated frame of reference. So don't bring in any pseudo forces. Laws of mechanics will be the same. Right? And he is also measuring the speed of light. So this has something to do with the measurement of the speed of light and this is the famous picture of the experiment by Michelson and Morley which a lot of people say uh, was uh, at the foundation of the theory of relativity which is not quite correct because um, here is an extract from the uh, history archives of the American Institute of Physics which points out that Einstein was certainly aware of the Michelson Morley experiment, but it perhaps did not play a big role in his composing or coming up with the theory of relativity. So this, if at all it played any role at all, it was only a minor one. So what did? So let's look at this experiment. So here you have got a region of space in which there is a magnetic field and this cross tells you that this is the tail of an arrow that you're looking at and the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the screen, to the plane of this figure. The magnetic field is orthogonal to the plane of the screen. It is going into the screen. Okay, so that is the direction of the magnetic field. And in this region of space, you have got a certain loop. Okay, this is just a wire and connected over here by a resistance. Now, the question is that if the loop is stationary, will there be any current in this? Will it be clockwise? Will it be anti-clockwise? There is no current. Right? Now suppose you have some device with which you control the position of the loop and you drag it, you drag the loop to the right. Now will you now have a current in the loop? Or what will be the direction of the current? It would be clockwise. Okay, and how do you get it? By thinking of a positive charge, like what generates a conventional current, and you construct the Lorentz force, QV cross B, you're absolutely right. And with this, you immediately find that there would be a current which is going clockwise. Okay, now let's extend this experiment further. Let's have the same situation. But now, you do not move the circuit, but instead you drag the field itself to the left. So the field can be generated by some horseshoe magnet or two magnets, and you move that magnetic assembly in the opposite direction. Now let us ask this question. Will there be a current in the loop? What will be the direction of the current? Again, it will be similar. And now if you do another experiment in which you do not move anything but just change the magnetic field by changing some controls and then again you can find that there would be an induced current. Now look at this experiment over here. In this experiment you have not moved the circuit so the Lorentz force would be zero because in the previous one here, you invoke this Q V cross B. So if this velocity of this charge was zero, the V cross B would be zero. And there is absolutely no Lorentz force in the next experiment. Right? So here in this experiment, there is no Lorentz force, yet you argue that there will be an identical current. So what kind of physics is this? Now how do you explain this? How do you explain that there will be a current? We all agree that there is a current. We all agree even with the direction of the current. But now we are confronted with the fact that we cannot invoke the Lorentz force. Because the velocity of this charge is zero. You are not moving it. What you are moving it is you are leaving it as it is. 
but you are dragging the magnetic field. So how do you explain this? Now this is a very fascinating example, which uh, many books dismiss as trivial, <laughs> okay, and some with wrong explanations. Oh, what is a big deal? There is a big deal. There is a very big deal about this. And let me tell you how big that deal is. Let me quote a distinguished physicist on this. So let me read this quotation for you. So the flux rule that the EMF in a circuit is equal to the rate of change of the magnetic flux through the circuit applies whether the flux changes because the field changes or because the circuit moves or both. Yet in our explanation of the rule, we have two completely distinct laws. One is Maxwell's equations, okay, which is the Faraday-Maxwell equation and the other is the Lorentz force V cross V. There are completely two different explanations. Okay? And this quote, let me extend this quote to the next part of the quote in which he points out that we know of no other place in physics where such a simple and accurate general principle requires for its real understanding and analysis in terms of two different phenomena. One is the Maxwell's equation, the second is the Lorentz force. Okay? And this is no ordinary man saying it, it's Richard Feynman. Okay? And in his lectures, which everybody always claims he has read. <laughs> but not many are able to recognize the quote. <laughs> So this is straight out of Feynman's lectures and this is because of the connections, the intrinsic connections between electrodynamics and relativity. Okay, so you have got uh, the Coulomb's law, the Ampere's law, the Faraday's uh, laws and so on. So all of this are embodied in Maxwell's equations and the theory of relativity is right at the heart of these explanations. Okay, the reason these, you have to invoke completely these two explanations is because of the intrinsic nature of the electrodynamic interaction. Okay, there is the electrodynamic interaction which is fundamental to this and this is what Einstein recognized from the symmetry of Maxwell's equations. Okay? Now, I mentioned in my earlier class that the connection between symmetry and conservation laws and the, the reason symmetry started playing a big role in physics, it all started out with Einstein. And this is where it began its journey. Okay? It, because in the symmetry of the Maxwell's equations, the curl of E and the curl of B, the two equations are completely symmetric. The equations for the divergence are also symmetric except for the fact that there are no magnetic monopoles, but other than that, they are completely symmetric. And this symmetry leads to the fact that when you take the subsequent, you carry out one more operation of this, because from this, it is very easy to take the divergence of these curlic expressions and get the wave equations, right? And when you get the wave equations, you find that the waves propagate at a certain velocity, which is the speed of light, and it is determined only by properties of vacuum. The speed of light is determined only by mu zero and epsilon zero and by nothing else. And when you look at the speed of the cricket ball, okay, or speed of the chicken crossing a road, you are always talking about a speed which is measured with reference to an observer. And with reference to some observer, it has got one value. With reference to another observer, it has got another value. But this observer disappears when you come to the speed of light because it is determined completely by properties of vacuum and by nothing else. So it is essentially determined by absolutely nothing. And these are important because unless these things are taken into account correctly, you cannot communicate with each other. So the cell phones won't work, no technology will work without relativity, without quantum theory. 
and these are absolutely important. So what I trying to recognize is that I, Maxwell's equations are correct in all inertial frames of references. They predict that light travels at the speed which is determined by mu zero epsilon zero and if the speed is the same in all inertial frames of references, what is speed? Speed is distance divided by time. Speed is the same, but then something has to change. <coughs> distance will change and time will change. It was this recognition which led him to the theory of relativity and then you get time dilation, length contraction and so on. So, okay, so all of these are consequences of uh, Einstein's intuition which led him to the theory of relativity. It also changes your perception of what is simultaneity because uh, what is simultaneous to one observer is not the same for another. So it also um, explains many other things like there is this famous twin paradox in relativity that a traveling twin uh, ages less than a homebound twin. And this twin paradox is explained in several books and there, there's a lot of literature on that. Um, some of it even invokes the general theory of relativity which is not correct because this is completely resolved within the framework of the special theory of relativity by simply um, analyzing the obvious consequences of Lorentz contraction and time dilation. So I will not get into these details but we have discussed uh, these things at length. Uh, we also discuss what is the paradox over here because women do not age at all. <laughs> that is to many the fundamental paradox. But anyway, so uh, it, it has other consequences that uh, what is space to an observer is a mix of space and time to another. So likewise, what is the electric field to an observer is a mix of electric and magnetic field to another observer and vice versa. So this has got very fascinating consequences which um, are responsible when we analyze uh, simple examples of this kind. So um, uh, some of my students, they have um, developed a nice software which illustrate uh, the connections between electrodynamics and the special theory of relativity. These programs are available for you to use. They also have important consequences in quantum mechanics because um, we often use the idea of a spin of a particle and these, uh, this, these models are absolutely wrong. Uh, spin has to be defined correctly in quantum mechanics. I'll probably do it in the afternoon session. Uh, you need the Dirac's formalism for which you need the special theory of relativity. So relativity has got important consequences in uh, classical electrodynamics and quantum mechanics and everywhere. So I think I'll stop here and we have uh, Professor Vigian's lecture uh, which is about to start. So I'll take a few minutes if there are any questions and then we'll have Professor Vigian's lecture. Any question? We can of course continue to chat during the break and uh, even later by email and so on. But if there is any quick question for now, uh, I'll be happy to take otherwise I get a break. <laughs> How do we mathematically reconcile with the pseudo force and the real force equations? Numerical. Well, uh, actually, by carrying out these simple transformations from of a position vector of an object in an inertial frame to the position vector of the same object in a non-inertial frame. Okay. And these two vectors you relate just by the triangle law of addition and then go on to construct the time derivative of that position vector. Take the second derivative, you get acceleration. You multiply it by the mass, you get the force. So these simple transformations give you the exact mathematical relationship between the accelerated acceleration seen by one observer in the inertial frame of reference and relates it exactly quantitatively to how the acceleration would be seen or observed by another observer in an accelerated frame of reference. And the two will be different. And the difference will be because one observer is in the inertial frame of reference 
who will define the fundamental laws of physical interactions and the other observer will invoke pseudo forces he will have to invent those pseudo forces to explain those effects so thank you very much i guess i will uh, invite professor vijayan i would like to take this opportunity to thank professor vijayan not just for giving the lecture which is about to begin but for making this course possible at all because uh, when i first gave this course which was uh, several years ago um it was possible only because uh, professor vijayan and i we discussed the physics we enjoyed uh, doing physics learning physics and uh, we both felt that okay these are certain things that we can introduce in undergraduate physics so we actually did it together so i'm uh, immensely grateful to professor vijayan for his partnership in developing this course thank you vijayan